They tell a story about a Jewish couple living on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, a studio apartment, one bedroom, and her brother moves in on them. I don't know if you ever had a brother move in on you, but this was a particular brother who had no job. He was a bachelor. He stays one day, two days, one week, two weeks. Vifel is a sheer, how much can you tolerate it? So after a while, subtly, the sister and the brother-in-law try to intimate to this young man that it's time to leave. But he does not get the message. What do they do? So they come up with a brilliant plan conv- created by a Yiddish cup. What's the plan? He tells his wife, you know, tonight when you serve me dinner, you'll serve soup. And I'll take one spoon of the soup, I'll taste it. And I'll tell you, honey, the soup is too salty. And you will argue with me. You will maintain that the soup is not too salty. And we'll get into this fake argument. And from the fake argument, we'll get into the fake conflict. And then we'll ask your brother, what is his opinion about the soup? And whoever he agrees with, the other one will throw him out of the house. Somehow, if you throw him out of the house because of a debate over whether the soup was too salty or not, it can be justified. Great. Dinner time comes. The wife serves a bowl of soup to her husband. He tastes the soup. Honey, usually you're on, but tonight the soup is horrible, disgusting abominable. And she's like, darling, the soup is impeccable. It's flawless. And he's honey, I would not feed this food to my enemy, the soup to my enemy. And she's like, your mother can't make such a soup to save her life. And he tells her, you wouldn't catch me dead eating this soup. To put it the way it was, from a fake fight, it turned into a very real conflict. All of the resentment, all of the issues they had with each other for many, many years emerged. Every iota of resentment and frustration contained in the precious brain of his wife emerged at that moment. A war broke out between this couple. And finally, at the height of the debate and the dispute, The great moment comes, the moment which called for all of it. He turns to his brother-in-law, his wife's brother, and he says, what is your opinion about the soup? Is the soup salty, too salty, or is it not too salty? And the brother scratches his forehead. He looks around. He meditates for a few moments, and he says, you know, I have to live here for another few months. I cannot afford to take any sides. Of course, reflective of the fact that very often conflict between people, between spouses, between individuals, is often not even about their own issues, but about somebody else's issues, and this generates the conflict. But I use this anecdote as an introduction into the discussion tonight. A very interesting and engaging mitzvah commandment in the portion of Ayikra, the opening portion of the Sefer Vayikra, the book of Leviticus. In chapter 2, verse 13, we have the following mitzvah. As you know, Vayikra deals with the many types of animal and grain offerings that were brought to the temple. Thus, chapter 2, verse 13 source number one in your curriculum, presents the following commandment. V'chol korban minchoscha ba-melech timlach. V'loisash bis melech bris eloikecha me'al minchosecha. Al kol korboncha takriv melech. Translation. You shall salt your every meal offering with salt. Do not eliminate the salt of your God's covenant from upon your meal offering. On your every offering, you shall offer salt. Consequently, every sacrificial part that made its way to the temple altar, 
to be consumed by the flames and ascend to heaven, as it were, was salted beforehand. No matter whether the offering consisted of meat, raw flour, baked matzah, unleavened bread, these were the three types of foods that were offered on the altar, meat, raw flour, or baked matzah. Any type of food that made its way to the altar needed to be salted on both sides to be fit for consumption on the altar. What is the rationale behind this mitzvah? Seems like a very straightforward, simple mitzvah. Make sure you salt all of your offerings. Don't eliminate salt. Fine. Why? What is the meaning? What is the symbolism? What is the logic behind this mitzvah? One of the most fascinating elements of Torah, transforming it into a lifelong journey of adventure and often ecstasy, is the fact that every single verse, mitzvah, law, episode, story, and message recorded in the Torah contains a minimum of four layers of interpretation, which correspond to the four layers of every human soul. There is the biological layer of human identity, the emotional layer of the human self, the cognitive and the spiritual. Every single law and story in the Torah can be explained on four different levels, each of them legitimate in its own context, each of them paralleling, corresponding to one layer of human consciousness. The four layers are known as pshat, remez, drush, sod. Together, their acronym is the word pardes, which means orchard, garden. Pardes is pshat, remez, drush, sod. The first layer is pshat, the simple, concrete meaning mirroring the down-to-earth biological dimension of life. This is the literal, pragmatic, concrete, you might call simple meaning of the verse, law, or mitzvah, or episode of the Torah. It parallels the biological dimension of self, the concrete, literal embodiment of life. What does it mean you're alive? You're biologically alive. That's the pshat level. The second level is known as remez, the symbolic or homiletical meaning of the particular aspect of Torah. The symbolism of it. This reflects the emotional plane of the soul, known as ruach. Why? Because emotions usually function as symbols of underlying subconscious experiences. Most emotions are smoke screens. They're symbolic. They have to be studied as symbolisms representing deeper underlying emotional experiences. Then we have the third level of explaining Torah, known as drush. Drush is the interconnected meaning which views all of Torah literature as a multi-complex, multi-faceted, multi-dimensional mosaic, as one large organism. Dirash sees the entire Torah literature as a single organism, as a single body, a large tapestry. This path demonstrates how every concept in Torah can only be fully understood when based on truths and ideas contained in all of Torah's writings. This layer mirrors the cognitive dimension of the soul known as neshama. And then we have the fourth layer of learning Torah, the ascetic or mystical dimension known as sod, the mystical explanation of Torah. This corresponds to the spiritual or transcendental dimension of human identity, the spiritual layer of human consciousness, known as Chaya. So we have Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama, Chaya, the biological, the emotional, the cognitive, and the transcendental, 
corresponding to pshat, remez, drush, and sod. The literal explanation of Torah, the homiletical or symbolic explanation of Torah, the explanation of Torah as an interconnected mosaic, and the spiritual, esoterical, mystical explanation of Torah. The mitzvah of salting every temple offering is no exception. It too contains four levels of interpretation. Let's dissect, let's go on a journey tonight into the four layers of interpretation with this mitzvah. On the practical level, we have the explanation presented by the Eben Ezra, Ibn Ezra, Rabbi Avram, Eben Ezra, and your sources, is one of the great biblical commentators. He lived in the 12th century, born in 1119, approximately 1119, passed away approximately 1194. He lived in Spain. He was a Spanish poet, philosopher, astronomer, and one of the greatest exponents of the literal and linguistic aspects of the Bible. And thus, the Eben Ezra gives his reason why we have to salt every offering. And in your curriculums, you can open it up. I read, Which means that the basis of this mitzvah is a demonstration of respect towards God. Nobody would dare serve a human king bland and tasteless food. The famous verse in Job which asks, Is bland food eaten without salt? Eov asks. Now though God obviously does not consume the food offered on the altar, we're not worried that God is going to have a lousy dinner because there's no salt. Nonetheless, it was the Torah's way of inculcating in the Jewish psyche a respect for the king of kings. You're offering a sacrifice to God, make sure it's salted. Don't give food, don't put food on the table when there's nishtak in zalt, when there's no salt. That's the literal explanation on the most basic literal level. There is another literal explanation, the one given by Rambam, Maimonides. Maimonides, Rambam, Rabbeinu Moshe, Ben Maimon, who also lived in the 12th century in Spain, and then in Morocco, and in Eretz Yisrael, in the Holy Land, and finally in Egypt. The great philosopher, physician, codifier, leader, he presents another practical reason for this law. And this is in the Rambam's Guide to Perplexed, Moir Nevuchim, section 3, essay 46, Chapter 46, again in your curriculum. The Rambam explains that the ancient pagans believed that their gods cherished blood. As a result of this myth, they did not want to lose even a single drop of blood from their offerings to these gods. So they wouldn't allow even a grain of salt to come in contact to their offerings because salt absorbs blood. In order to eradicate the worship of idolatry and blood, the Torah would not accept an offering that was not saturated in salt. According to Maimonides, it's the Torah's method of deprogramming the Jewish people from the pagan myths that have saturated civilization at the time. As the Rambam puts it, in the second paragraph in your curriculums, You'll never find salt in any of their offerings. And that's why God tells us, make sure that your offerings don't only have salt, they're saturated with salt. What they perceive as the ultimate rebellion against their gods is for us, the way how we come closer to God. And this is the Torah's psychological way of reprogramming the Jewish psyche. So, the practical reason is, this was the way of the pagans, the way of idolatry, don't use any salt. The Torah says, I want you to use salt. Next level, the symbolic level. The first two explanations of Ibn Ezra, 
Rabbeinu Avram, Evan Ezra, the Evan Ezra, and the Rambam, Maimonides, both explain it on a very practical level. Why the Torah wants us to put salt on the offering. Now we take it to the symbolic level, known as Remez. And this is presented in the 12th century book known as Sefer HaChinuch, the book of education. Its brilliant author remains unknown until today. It's assumed to be the Spanish Rabbi Aharon Halevi. He is assumed to be the author of Sefer HaChinuch, the book of education. A brilliant book which is really an encyclopedia of all of the 613, 613 mitzvahs of the Torah, a brief description of each mitzvah, a brief analysis of its reasons and its practical laws. This was the great contribution of the Sefer HaChinuch, the Book of Education. In Mitzvah 119, dedicated to the concept of placing salt on every offering, the Sefer HaChinuch gives us the symbolic explanation, and again, you have it in your curriculum. Hamelach mekayim kol dover u matzil ala hefsed vahari kovin. Kain bemaisa ha karbin, ye notzil odom in a hefsed, vitishomer nafshoi vitishoer kayemes laad. The mitzvah, according to the chinuch, was symbolic of a message. Just as salt preserves food which would otherwise decay, the temple offerings preserved the people who brought them, atoning for their wrongdoings, securing the internal, the eternal endurance of their souls. Salt preserves food, and the carbon, the sacrifice to God, preserves the human being and his or her soul. This is the symbolic reason behind salt. It's representing a message. There's no need for physical salt on a practical level, level to make it taste good or to do it differently than the idol worshippers as Ebenezer and Maimonides. But it represents something. It symbolizes something. Salt preserves food. The offering preserves the soul. Next, the interconnected level, drash, drush. This is presented, actually, in this case, by none other than Rashi. The greatest biblical commentator, Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki Rashi from France, who lived in the 11th century, before Evan Ezra and Maimonides. Rashi was born approximately 1040 and passed away approximately in the year 1105. He usually adheres to the first level of Torah interpretation. Rashi states a few times in his commentary, Ani loi basi ela mikra. My mission statement is to explain the first level of Torah interpretation, the literal. But in this instance, he offers a rather dramatic midrashic interpretation, tracing the mitzvah back to the genesis of existence. Rashi focuses on the enigmatic expression in this biblical verse, which we quoted in the beginning, where the Pasuk says, the verse says, Don't eliminate the salt of your God's covenant from upon your meal offering. Why is the salt associated with a covenant, with a bris, with a divine covenant? And Rashi says, you have it in the curriculum, God made a covenant with salt, during the time of creation. The lower waters were promised that they would be offered to the altar through the salt and through the pouring of the water on the festival of Sukkot. What does this mean? Here we have a classical level of drash, an interconnected interpretation. The opening portion of the Torah in Bereshus relates how on the second day of creation, God created a division between the heavenly waters above the firmament, firmament and the earthly waters below the rakia, below the firmament. Initially, all the water was one on Sunday. On Monday of the creation, God creates a separation, a partition between the waters. You have the higher waters and the lower waters. The Medrash records that the earthly waters began weeping. 
Mayim tachtoinim boichin. Anan be'inon lemev ekadamalk. We too crave to be close to God. Why have we be aban- Why have we been abandoned? Why were we thrown below? To comfort the lower waters, God makes a covenant with the water. What is the wa- what is the covenant? That the lower waters will one day become a critical component in the temple service. For salt, which comes from the sea, would be placed on every single offering. One more thing he promised the waters. On Sukkot, there was a special tradition, a ritual, where each morning of the holiday of Sukkot, water was poured on the altar, known as Nisu Chamayim. These were the two promises God made with the lower waters in order to comfort it from its grievance and pain for being cast below. Now we come to the mystical level. What is the mystical meaning behind this mitzvah of placing salt on every offering? Here we are introduced to the commentary of Rabbeinu Bechaya, the great Spanish biblical commentator in the 14th century, Rabbeinu Bechaya, also alluded to somewhat, although on a different level, in the commentary of the Ramban, Nachmanides, the 13th century great Spanish rabbi, philosopher, biblical commentator, physician, Ramban, Nachmanides, Rabbi Nomeisha ben Nachman. The Kabbalists explain, as Rabbi Nobuchayi elaborates, that salt contains two paradoxical properties. On one hand, it's destructive. It prevents plants from growing, and it corrodes most substances. That's why the Yam HaMelach, the salty sea in Israel, is called the Dead Sea in English, in Arabic as well. Why is it called the Dead Sea? Because its tremendous quantities of salt kill all potential growth and kill all living creatures besides human beings who actually like to hang out and float on the Dead Sea. But if you take a fish and you place it in the Dead Sea, if fish by mistake flow into the Dead Sea, they have no chance of survival. They die immediately. Because of its saltiness, it kills. So it's the Dead Sea. On the other hand, conversely, salt preserves food. It saves food. It helps food survive. It's also an essential component of the diets of human beings and other warm-blooded animals. So we have here a paradox. And the paradox is expressed also in the taste of salt. On one hand, salt has a bitter taste. It's not a very nice taste. It's pretty horrible. On the other hand, salt gives food a delicious and spicy flavor it would never have on its own. As the good old Yiddish saying in almost every Jewish home, Sefelt abisalazaltz. It's missing a little salt. Salt gives it a delicious flavor. The very creation of salt, suggests the Kabbalists, represent these two distinct forces. Salt is distributed in the oceans, in the seas, in the lakes. Its source is water. But dryness and aridity are critical to its production. So salt represents the synthesis of moisture and dryness. In Kabbalah, These two qualities of salt embody two attributes of judgment and discipline versus compassion and empathy. Gvura versus chesed. God says the Midrash first fashioned the universe with the attribute of strict discipline. Midas hadin. Then he realized the the world will not survive. So he incorporated into the fabric of the cosmos the quality of grace, of empathy, of midas harachamim. Salt represents then Gvura and Rachamim. I said Gvura and Chesed. Gvura and Rachamim. That's the correct terminology in Rabbeinu Bechaya. Salt then, we discover, represents the very foundation and covenant of existence. The two polar forces with which God created the world. And the covenant with God represented through the offerings have this double component.
Now, many of these explanations, or all of these explanations, as interesting as they are, they leave us wanting. They still seem to beg for further explanation and clarification. Let's go through the list. Evan Ezra's idea of offering God tasty food begs the question. After everything is said and done, God needs not salted meat, nor salted grain, nor salted matzah, nor salted flour to enjoy the temple meal. Must we really resort to this practice in order to demonstrate respect to the Almighty? Human food needs salt. But would it really be disrespectful to God if we don't offer the meat on the altar with salt? I mean, it's not being eaten. It's being burnt up in the flames. Maimonides' explanation about rejection, the pagan attraction to blood, is also puzzling. Would the Torah give the Jewish people a mitzvah for all of eternity that has no inherent value or meaning save the delegitimization of an ancient pagan myth? Which is a question the commentators discuss on many of the explanations of Maimonides in the Guide to the Perplexed. But today we're tonight we're discussing this particular mitzvah. This means that the mitzvah has no inherent value. It's just a response to paganism in a milieu of paganism. No relevance to other times. The symbolic explanation in the Sefer HaChinuch in the Book of Education also leaves us wanting. Salt preserves the food, not the person who eats the food. How does the salt on the meat of the sacrifice represent the eternity of the Jewish soul who offers the sacrifice? Rashi's dramatic idea about the covenant of God fashioned with the lower waters also leaves us with a question. If God really wished to placate the lower waters, why didn't he command us to pour the lower water each day on the altar? Why did he instruct the Jew to merely use the salt taken from the waters for the temple offerings and only one time a year on Sukkot, one holiday of the year, do we pour water on the altar? You really want to placate the lower waters? I have a better, have a better option. Don't separate the waters. <laughs> you separate the waters, you create higher waters and lower waters. Now the lower waters are sad, they're grieving. We want to be close to God. So you comfort them. How do you comfort them? You don't tell them, okay, I'll undo the separation. No, the gulf remains. What are we going to do? We're not even going to use you every day as a means to offer a sacrifice to God. We're not going to pour you on the altar every day. We're going to use your salt. The salt that's found in the lower waters will be offered on every offering. And every sukkah will actually pour water on the altar. Why is he placating the lower waters through this fashion? Finally, the Kabbalistic insight about the connection of discipline and empathy represented in salt, which both preserves and destroys, which both rescues and undermines, which is both connected to moisture and dryness, Why is this combination and the combination of these two forces so crucial to accompany every single offering? There was not one offering on the altar which did not have salt. 300 years ago, with the birth of Rabbi Yisrael Baal Shem Tov, who was born in 1698, and passed on in 1760, a fifth layer of Torah interpretation was revealed. The Baal Shem Tev's model of Torah interpretation developed even more intricately by his disciples and the disciples of his disciples throughout the generations came to be known as the teachings of Hasidus, Hasidism. Today, you have probably 2,000 volumes of the section of Torah known as Hasidus. While the first four levels of Torah interpretation 
reflect the four layers of the soul, the biological, the emotional, the cognitive, and the spiritual. The teachings of Hasidus mirror the fifth layer of the soul. The fifth layer of the soul is the quintessential, undefined eye of the human identity. In Hebrew, it's known as Yechida. There is Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama, Chaya, and Yechida. It has no definition. It has no description. Only that it's Yechida. It's one. This is the very essence of the eye. There is the biological eye. There is the emotional eye. There is the cognitive eye. There is the spiritual eye. And then there is the quintessence. Quint actually is the fifth level in Greek. Quint. That's why it's called the quint essence, essence the fifth level. Yechida, this is the very essence of the eye. It's the dimension of consciousness that is embodied in that part of the self which is not defined by any particular quality or characteristic. Not biology, not emotion, not cognition, and not spirituality. Only by the profound set sense that it exists unconditionally as a piece of God, as it were, who also exists unconditionally. And this is the deepest core of human consciousness. The fifth layer of identity is infinitely removed from all the other layers of identity because it's undefined. It cannot be captured in a particular word or term or language. Yet, precisely because of its undefined quality, it can be seen as the core and the essence of every facet and experience of the soul. The most essential state of I is at the root and at the core of every single dynamic of the human condition. Because it's so infinitely removed from any particular quality, it also constitutes the essence of every quality and experience. Who are you at your most basic and fundamental level? Can you answer the question? I know who I am on a physical level, or at least I hope to know who I am. I know who I am emotionally. Well, that gets complicated, but at least we try. Some of us sit in therapy for many, many years to try to figure out who we are emotionally, right? You know the story of the guy who went to the Bahamas on vacation, and he's having a great time. He writes a postcard to a psychotherapist from the Bahamas. He says, my dear doctor, I'm here in the Bahamas and I'm having a great time. I wish you were here to tell me why. So some of us attempt for many years to figure ourselves out emotionally and then to figure ourselves out cognitively and to maximize our cognitive power. How much percent of your brain do you think you use throughout your life? And then there's, of course, becoming aware of our spiritual and transcendental yearnings and aspirations. And every person functions on different layers, different times, different days, different hours, different moods, different states, different ages. Who are you right now? Are you just a biological, beastly creature? Are you an emotional creature? Are you a cognitive creature? Oh, we are mindful. Are you a transcendental creature? But these are all defined qualities. These are all defined characteristics. We can discuss them. We can write books about them. We can pontificate, lecture about them, and certainly philosophize about them. Endlessly, of course, as the human race has been doing since the first human being experienced consciousness. And God's, one of God's first questions to the human being is, Ayeka, Vubistu, where are you? Do you know who you are? But then there's Yechida. Yechida is the core, of course. Yechida is the fifth level that's not defined. It's not that it lacks definition because we're uneducated. Because we did not read enough, because we did not think enough, because we did not live enough. We did not live long enough. It's undefined by its very nature. It comes from a place that's beyond any particular definition. The core of the self cannot be defined according to Kabbalah and Hasidus in any particular way as it reflects God, who is also undefined in any way. It's the essence of all essences. It's the essence beyond, beyond language. So on one hand, it's the most removed, and on the other hand, it's the most intimate. It's the most unrecognizable dimension, and yet it's the most recognizable dimension because it saturates and it permeates every single experience. 
You cannot say that your emotion is involved in every experience. Sometimes you do things without emotion, at least without conscious emotion. And certainly you're not going to say that your mindfulness and cognition and awareness is involved in every activity or in every word or in every thought. And certainly not your transcendental and spiritual self. But your essence is always there. Your essence is always present. The essential I is the core of our biological, emotional, cognitive, and spiritual identity. This is true about the fifth level of Torah interpretation. Hasidus does not compete with any other layer of Torah study. On the contrary, Hasidus accentuates and highlights and brings to the surface the quintessential core of Torah the pure godliness of Judaism. As a result, it infuses each of the other four layers of Torah interpretation with a new majestic depth, vitality, and life. One that emerges when something's, anything's, pristine essence is manifested. What happens to you when you're in touch with your deepest self? All your layers are now enriched. All your layers, all your facets, all your dimensions now shine in a new way. We know it from our own lives. When we're in a good mood, when you feel really happy, when you feel inner wholesomeness and harmony, everything you do is different. The way you answer the phone, the way you write an email, the way you send a text message, the way you say good morning, good night, the way you greet your wife or husband when you come home, the way you embrace your children in the evening, the way you eat, the way you walk. Everything is changed when your essence is present. So Hasidus, we have to understand, is not an additional part of Torah, a variant perspective. There's the perspective of Pshat, of Remez, of Jerush, of Sod, and then there's another perspective, Hasidus. That's a poor and impoverished understanding of what Hasidus is. Rather, Hasidus exposes the raw core of all of the four layers of Torah. Hasidus accentuates the deepest essence of all of the layers of Torah interpretation. All of them are now seen in a new depth and clarity as a result of the Hasidic explanation. So Hasidus is not another explanation, just like Yechida is not another layer of identity in addition to the four layers. It's the core of all layers. Because it's the undefined essence, so it redefines or it gives a new oimek, a new soulfulness to all of the layers. So tonight we want to explore the fifth layer. The Hasidic perspective on the mitzvah of salting every offering that makes its way to God's altar. And then we come back and we revisit the first four explanations. First, we explore the fifth level, the Yechida level, the essential level. And then we go back and we revisit the four explanations and we see how the fifth layer of commentary grants us a new vibrancy, a new depth, which we now can confer upon the previous insights. One that reveals their innate core. So the fifth level will not compete with the other four. The fifth level will just help us see the other four in their ultimate light because it will reveal their true essence, the ultimate depth. Suck the marrow out of the pshat and the remez and the drush and the sot. You could learn pshat without its essence. You could learn Remez without its essence. You could learn Jewish without its essence. You could learn Sud without its essence. Just like you can be biologically alive, but you're not in touch with your essence. And you could be emotionally present, but your essence is missing. And therefore your emotions sometimes are going all over the place. Or they need lots of healing. And you can be cognitively alive, but not in touch with the real essence of your ability, of your creativity. And of course you can have spiritual experiences, but not in touch with your spiritual essence. When you do have the fifth level, all of them are now functioning on a deeper level. What does Hasidus have to say? Why is there a mitzvah to put salt on every offering? When we approach God, when we make an offering to God, suggest the Hasidic masters, we must remember that the offering 
always comes eclipsed with salt. There is always salt on top of the offering. You see, one of the greatest challenges, one of the greatest causes of frustration in our mental, moral, and psychological lives is the realization that we must always battle with bitter forces, with distasty, distasteful and dark forces. Whether these forces are packaged as vulgar passions, ugly temptations, horrible addictions, maybe profound fear, insecurity, shame, guilt, lack of security, the feeling that we're not entitled, maybe tendencies towards melancholy, laziness, apathy, detachment, dejection, depression, a horrible low self-image. Most human beings never rid themselves completely from the struggles that accompany every attempt to live a truly wholesome, harmonious, and meaningful and dignified life. Our natural instincts and cravings always threaten to undermine our moral, sane, and spiritual growth. And this endless battle proves to many that after all of their moral and spiritual labor, it ultimately remains futile. Essentially, they're gross, they're primitive, they're underdeveloped. People ask, when will the struggle cease? This is the cry of many a person. Well, when, I, when will I finally become liberated from my demons? When will I finally be able to begin and bathe in endless light? When will my relationship with God become an all-encompassing, sugar-sweet experience? Now, these struggles, as I said, vary. Many different people many different ways, at many different moments. But the common denominator is that there's usually a struggle to overcome. Inner, outer, spiritual, psychological, physical, emotional. But there are barriers that you have to overcome. And when you overcome some barriers, there's usually another layer to the onion that you discover you have to peel. To confront this critical dilemma, the Torah comes, and in a very moving verse, in Vayikra, teaches us, You shall salt your every meal offering with salt. Don't eliminate the salt of your God's covenant from upon your meal offering. I'll call karbon takriv melach. On your every offering you shall offer salt. Three times in the same verse. Salt, salt, salt. You shall salt your every meal offering. Call karbon minchascha ba melach timloch. Don't eliminate salt. Bring salt on every offering. Three times the same commandment in the same verse. And you have four times the word melech. Ba melech, timlech, melech, melech. The salt accompanying every offering to God is not a tragedy. It's not an aberration. It's not a demonstration that you haven't touched heaven. No, the salt is part of God's covenant. It's an indispensable component of the way he desires that you serve him. You were not created in order to discover truth with a sense of heavenly sweetness, celestial purity. Devoid of stress, of struggle, of doubt, of fragmentation. You were created in order to confront darkness, to confront the soul, to subdue it. Each of your offerings to God, for it to fulfill its calling, will be covered with salt, must be covered with salt. It's infused with the struggle to crush and transcend the salty, the bitter, the horrible aspects of your life. So don't get depressed from the salt in your life. For God, your salt is part and parcel of the offering that ascends to heaven. So the very salt you're lamenting about from God's perspective is part of the offering He desires from you. Why? What does this mean? What is the explanation? The Tanya chapter 27 offers the following explanation. We have to examine the physical properties of salt. Is salt horrible? 
or is salt delicious? Is it bitter or is it tasty? It depends, of course. On its own, salt doesn't have a good taste. It's bitter. But when it's employed to serve another food, it can become a lovely ingredient. One that rescues the dish from being a bore. The salt, bitter on its own, may bestow upon other foods a richness of taste, a delightful tang that inspires taste buds like nothing else. And this is true in our spiritual lives as well. Taken independently, our salty and bitter characteristics and struggles are often hopeless, pointless, and demoralizing. They can drag us into the muck and derail us from our calling in life and our true essence. But when the very salt becomes part of a larger dish, when our darkness is placed in the context of our service to God, when we discover that our individual and unique path to God consists of subduing the negative, conquering the immoral, saying no to fear, challenging darkness, then the very salt and bitterness grants the dish a spiciness, a drama, a depth and a royalty that it could have never had enjoyed otherwise. Practically speaking, when you have a struggle in your life, you can see it in two ways. As a force which pulls you away from your objective, as a force which derails you from your mission statement, as something that came to bound to drag you down. But you can view your struggle as something else in a different context. You can view it as a force which is part of your objective, as a force which is part of your mission statement. Part of your work in life is to challenge this demon, to confront this darkness. God did not create holy people to do holy things. He did not want holy people to do holy things. He wanted unholy people to subdue their darkness. The objective of existence in this world, as the Tanya and the Hasidic masters explain, is not just to generate light. There is another objective. The main objective is to subdue darkness. The main objective is to confront the unholiness, to confront the demon, to confront the opaqueness, to challenge it, to excavate the light within the darkness, to transform the darkness. So when I have the darkness in my life, I ought not to feel, oi, this is destroying everything. It's not destroying anything. On the contrary, this is the salt which can now add spice to your service of God. God wants you to serve him with salt, through salt. The salt is the objective when you subdue the bitterness. The salt on its own is bitter. But it's part of a very delicious and tasty dish. It creates your service of God. Don't despise your salt. On the contrary, because of the salt, the negative itself becomes part of the beauty, becomes part of your service. It gives you the opportunity to subdue the darkness. They tell the story about a great king who once summoned a Jewish artist and he tells the artist, he says, you know, I need you to draw a portrait of me, but two conditions. The portrait must be accurate and I must appear very handsome in the portrait. There was one problem. The king had a horrible blemish on top of his eyebrow. <laughs> so the Jewish artist doesn't know what he does, what to do. If it's accurate, it must have the blemish. If it has the blemish, the king will not look handsome. And if he violates the instruction of the king, he can come out with a head shorter. What do you do? So the Jew meditated and reflected. And what was his decision? His decision was he drew, made a portrait of the king while engaged in deep reflection and meditation. So what was the position? The king's hand was right over his eyebrow, engaged in deep thought. It was accurate, and the king looked lovely and handsome. He took the very blemish, he took the very problem, and he used it as a catalyst to create the king in a reflective and meditative position which actually portrayed a very thoughtful and mindful person. Melach is the same letters like lech and bread. An offering is called lachmi liyishai, my bread, reach nichoichi, my aroma. So the Jew takes the salt and turns the melach into lechem, turns the salt into a delicious offering for God. So when I have a struggle, when I have negativity, when I have a challenge in me, 
when I have darkness in me, don't let, I, I can't allow the darkness to tell me, oh, you're bad. You're down. There's no hope for you. On the contrary, take the salt and put it into the dish of serving God. God wants you to subdue your darkness. Not to be filled with light, to transform darkness into light. Every offering will have salt. It's not a tragedy. On the contrary, this is what constitutes serving God. Serving God in this world means you serve Him with your salt. If you followed last week's class, Pekude, Rabbi Akiva's contribution, every thorn becomes a crown. I'll call kites for kites till they till and shalalachas, as discussed in the previous class about the forgotten souls last Monday. Now we can return to the other explanations of the salting mitzvah and discover how the Hasidic perspective allows each of them to cast their individual glow in a new light. The true core of Evan Ezra's idea can now be appreciated. God needs not the salt on the offerings for the physical taste, but Hashem desires that man prepare for him the dish that utilizes salt in order to grant it a new, unique taste. For this captures something essential in man's service of the Almighty. Rambam's explanation, too, can be comprehended in a deeper way. The salt and our offerings represent our continuous attempt to escape from the pagan cult of darkness. Until Mashiach comes, the worship of blood on many different levels is part of our psyche, and we must battle it with salt. Rashi's idea regarding the covenant fashioned with the lower waters becomes absolutely marvelous. Water represents delight and pleasure. The higher waters represent our spiritual pleasures and aspirations. The lower waters represent our earthly, earthly and beastly pleasures, aspirations, and sometimes addictions. The lower waters cry, why did we fall below? We also wish to be close to God. Your darkness too craves sublimation. God's way of placating the lower waters is not by removing the gulf. It's also not by instructing us to pour water each day on the altar because that would defeat the entire purpose of the lower waters. For the lower waters to fulfill their purpose of challenging the person to battle for truth, of challenging the person to transform darkness into light, they must remain lower waters, not higher waters. But God demonstrates to these waters how they fulfill their mission and reach their deepest potential by being who they are, lower waters. Salt, the bitter substances coming from the lower waters, must be placed on every offering, which give, what gives every human offering in this world its profoundest taste is the salt, the bitter and lowliness stemming from the lower waters, which we then offer to God. We take our darkness and we subdue it. The symbolic meaning of the salt is also appreciated in a new way. The very salt which accompanies our service of God constitutes our greatest spiritual power and endurance, according to the Chinuch, because the ultimate objective of existence was to subdue and transform the darkness in the world and in our psyche and transform it. So our very saltness when exploited to serve God, becomes the source of our endurance. And finally, we have a much better understanding of the Kabbalistic insight into salt, combining the forces of compassion and judgment. The connection to the temple offering is now more than obvious because the essence of the experience of offering one's identity to God must always synthesize these two forces the sense of celebration and the sense of judgment and severity against the powers of darkness. When we offer ourselves to God, there's always an element of ecstasy and exaltation, and there's an element of battle and confrontation. So in summation, the next time you experience an ugly craving, a profound fear, say to yourself, this ought not to demoralize me. God wants me to serve him with salt. Apparently, it tastes much better. Oh,
Hey, <laughs> 